Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. One of the best known and favorite Psalms is Psalm 23. You may not know it, but it is read on the Shabbat. Every Shabbat in the morning, after the time of prayer, when people come home and they sanctify that day for the second time, first time in the evening, second time in the morning, we read Psalm 23. Now, we know that Shabbat has a connection to the kingdom of God. And when we look at Psalm 23, we see that there are many promises in this psalm that speak about God's comfort, His compassion, His love, His leadership, His provision. And all of this speaks about the fact that our God is the King of kings. And when He says He will, He's able to carry it out and make that a reality in your life and my life. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to Psalm 23. The first thing that we see here is that this psalm was written by King David. And in the first verse, it says a psalm of David, and then David makes a proclamation that the Lord, he is my shepherd. Now, the concept of a shepherd in that time was, was most informing. A shepherd would be one that would care for the flock, be willing to lay down his life, and there was a close connection between the shepherd and all the sheep. As you know, Messiah taught this, that the sheep would recognize they could discern the voice of the shepherd. And they knew that if they stayed close to that shepherd, there was protection and that he would lead them to good provision, a provision that would satisfy. And this is what David is conveying in this first part of this psalm. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, and if your Bible says, I shall not want, this is an incorrect translation. It is a word for I will not lack. It emphasizes not a change in me, but rather the fact that God is faithful to provide truly what we need, not necessarily what we want. One of the signs of a believer's maturing is that more and more that believer will begin to agree with God and, and hear this very carefully, that they will desire the things that God has for them. They will want what God wants. There will be that agreement that we will be conformed to the likeness and thought perspective to the living God. So it's when we, and here's the connection between this opening verse. It is when we hear, obey, respond to the shepherd that we're going to find under his leadership that there's going to be nothing that we truly lack. And if we're a wise sheep, there will be nothing that we want that he doesn't want. So there will be that, that agreement. So the Lord, he is my shepherd. I shall not lack. And then look at the next verse, at least in the Hebrew text. It speaks about God's leadership, God guiding. And one of the things we need to realize is this, that when we acknowledge God in our life, 
When we desire what He desires, when we are submissive to His leadership, then we will experience His guidance. If we're not interested in His leadership, we will not experience Him guiding us, Him leading us to those good places. And in this verse, verse 2 in the Hebrew text, it says, in pastures of, and the next word is the word deshe in, in Hebrew. And in modern Hebrew, it speaks about a lush, a manicured yard where there is grass that is well taken care of and for, for a sheep. It would be a, a measure of provision. It would be something that satisfies. So the Lord, he's our shepherd. We will lack nothing. And the reason why we will lack no good thing is because we find here, look at the text, in good pasture, green pasture. It's location that is very, very lush and fertile. He says, he makes me, this is David, David says, he, the Lord, my shepherd, makes me to lie down. And the word here for lying down normally refers to just that, a, a sheep or a, a goat or a cow, some domesticated animal, lying down for the purpose of, and hear this, for the purpose of rest or contentment. Now, this is a very important word because, more often than not, such an animal will not lay down unless he feels very secure. An animal that is insecure does not experience that, that provision, that protection of that shepherd, one that feels that he is at risk or his needs are not being met he will remain standing in order to move away quickly or to see where he should be. But one that is satisfied, confident, and feels secure, it's this type of animal that lies down. So it's in the hifil in the Hebrew, which means that the shepherd will cause make him to lie down, meaning that this shepherd will provide all of those things so this animal will feel secure. Not only this, but in the second part of the verse, by waters that are still. And this means that they're not dangerous waters. They are waters that... Now, here's something that, that many people might overlook. But when the waters are still, it gives you perception. You can see better into still water than you can into rushing water. And therefore, once again, he leads us to waters that are not full of risk or danger. That animal can look out and see any type of threat. Likewise, he does not have to worry about going into the water and being swept away. There's no danger whatsoever. So in this passage of Scripture, this particular voice, we see here that uh, by or alongside near waters that are still, he leads me. And these things, for the most part, there is a physical aspect to them whether they be emotionally or whether they be inwardly how we feel, it's based upon that which provides for the physical needs. And then notice something else. When we move into the, the next verse, we see here, my soul. Now we're dealing with that which is more spiritual. My soul, he will restore. And this is one that has to do with going back to its original condition. What God, in other words, intended. And this is how God works in the life of his covenant people. He moves in order to restore us back to his intentions. And, and here's something that we have to ask ourselves, and that is this. Am I interested 
in what God intends for me. His intentions, his purposes, why he created me, why he saved me, are these things what motivates me to get up in the morning and go to work following him, being his child. So he is someone that's going to restore us back to his intentions. Once more, my soul he restores, and once more, he leads me, he guides me in the pathways, and it's plural. The pathways, and it speaks here, the plural is used to show a, a multiplicity, meaning that, that our pathways, and it's the pathway, what's the next word? Righteousness, righteous pathways. And we should be traveling in these paths. Whatever we're doing, whatever we're going, we need to, and here's something that perhaps the text is telling us, that the direction that he's leading, we need to be making that which is righteous. As the psalmists or as the prophets say, execute righteousness, being an influence for them. So he leads me. He is working in my life in order that my life manifests righteousness, and therefore he leads me in the pathways of righteousness. Why? On account of his name. So we see something. His name, his character, but it's also his reputation. Making his name known. And how do we do that? When we are executing righteousness, behaving in a way, bringing righteous outcomes into a certain circumstance that we find ourselves within. In the world that we live in, there is great injustice. So we are supposed to be an instrument that takes that injustice and makes it just in order that righteousness is manifested on account of his name, and when we are walking in his character, yes, there's going to be a righteous outcome, but as I say so, so often, there is that close relationship between the word righteousness and the word glory. Now, not from a language standpoint, but from a a actual outcome. When there is righteousness, that righteousness will manifest the glory of God. And that is what we are created. Created the first time, sin interfered with us, but through being born again, this new life, this regeneration, we can once more be instruments that reflect the glory, the character, the the truth of God. Verse verse 4 in the Hebrew text, it begins by, Also, and this word gam in Hebrew can also be thought of, it's a synonym in certain cases of the Hebrew word afilu, which means even. So even when I walk, or because I walk, this may speak of an outcome that the world uh, places upon a faithful individual. Because it is when I walk being led by him, That sometimes I'm going to be walking, what does it say? Be gay sal mavet. Gay is a valley, and the word sal is, in this case, it's the word for shade, the valley valley of the shadow of mavet death. Realize, at times when I'm walking, God will lead me into, at times, very dangerous circumstances. I will be led into the domain of the enemy. Why? I've got work to do. He wants to use me in the midst of this darkness in order to manifest light, to be a source, an instrument of of revelation. So he says, at times, I will walk in the valley of the shadow of death. But if God is leading me into that, I can have, and don't miss this, I can have assurance. Now, I just want to pause for a moment and and emphasize that one of the great benefits we have as a covenant believer, a believer that enters into that new covenant through Messiah, through that we can have, and I would write this word down, 
This would be a word that would cause me to offer up thanksgiving to God repeatedly, daily. And that is, I can have assurance. And this assurance is going to produce, it is going to breed confidence in my life concerning the faithfulness of God. And I want to say that again. It is of the utmost importance that each believer learns this. God, he gives us assurance. And that assurance, when we say yes to that, I trust in that, I believe that, my life is founded upon God's faithful promises. I believe them and I'm assured of them. God doesn't say one thing and do something else. God doesn't say, here's my promise, but in reality, I'm never going to do that for that person. No, he says things and we can be assured. So that assurance is going to produce in me confidence. But here's what you need to see. Not confidence in yourself. That's foolishness. Confidence in God's faithfulness that you can depend upon him. That's why he says earlier, even though I walk where? In the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Fearing no evil. Evil, the outside, that which is outside of God's will. I'm not afraid of experiencing something outside of God's will because God leads me in his will. And in his will, I can expect with assurance his provision. So I will fear no evil. And here's the great thing. Keep reading last half of verse 4. For you, and this is you, O God, my shepherd, my Savior, my Lord. He says, for you are with me. Now, notice, it is not, do not misunderstand and misappropriate the text here. Because what he's saying is this, not wherever I go, he's going to be with me. Word of God doesn't say that. Now, he will never leave us nor forsake us. The Holy Spirit will not uh, depart from a true believer. But one can render the Holy Spirit ineffective in his life by walking in disobedience. Now, the Holy Spirit, he will function, but that will be to bring conviction, a knowledge of sin, to, to move us to repent. But the Holy Spirit is not going to bless us. He's not going to provide. He's not going to comfort us. He's not going to do these things when we are in the midst of disobedience, walking outside of his will. The Holy Spirit's going to move and be, and here's the key, that you are with me. When do I have the assurance and the blessings, the provisions of God when he's with me, when I'm in his will? wanting, desiring to accomplish his purpose. When that's my heart, and that should be the heart of everyone who is a believer. The text speaks about our heart being established by him. And when I have a heart that's established by him, what he wants, his desires, are going to be the desires of my heart. That's what that scripture says when he will give to me. He will place within me, his desires. So I'll have the desires in my heart that belong to him. When that's the case, not only will I desire and behave in a way that's pleasing to him, but I will be a recipient and I can have confidence of God's provision. And therefore, just like it says here, I will fear no evil because you, he says, you are with me me your rod and your staff now here this uh first word shevet it is a a rod a staff these words are synonyms different bibles will translate them uh, uh in a reverse form makes no difference because these words relate to a staff a rod that which one can lean on for support when one is tired, it gives them support. It also can be an instrument of, of defense. 
It can be a weapon of war, of attack, and it also can be a, an instrument of discipline on those, those sheep themselves. So what he says here is this, when he uses the two word, your, your staff or your rod, they, they comfort me, or as we read this, notice what it says. Your, your staff and your rod, they comfort me, meaning this. This word comfort has to do with bringing something that is in light with the purposes, the will of God. So God will defend me when I need defending. He will discipline me when, he, when I need discipline. He will go to war for me when, when the enemy is coming against me. All these things. God, this rod, this staff, it provides comfort because God will use them in order to minister, to work in my life, to go to battle in my situation so that, that he leads me to where he wants me to be. Verse, verse 5. Verse 5, and I want to translate this very literally, Taruch lefanai shulchan neged tzorai. Literally, you prepare or arrange. And, and it's probably better, you arrange before me, lefanai, before me, shulchan, a table. And the next word, neged, neged, means against or before. And what he's saying is this. The enemy, and let's just read all of it. Normally it's translated, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my, notice what it says, my enemies in the plural. What it says is this. When the enemies, and it's in the plural, multiple, many, when the enemies are in my domain, where I am, where I'm located, this is not a cause for fear. It is not a cause for, for failing, running away in defeat. But we can be assured that God can still minister, provide, that he can nourish us in the midst of this. And, and some would say that this table has to do with a, a banquet, not just a meal that he's going to feed me in the midst of this, but it can be related to the concept, the Hebrew word seguda, which is a, a meal of, of significance, a meal that has a purpose behind it. So the message is this. Even when the enemies are, are around me, that does not in any way, I want to say that one more time, that in no way hinders God from, from providing and doing what he wants in my life. So we read, you prepare before me a table against before my enemies, and you anoint with oil. And, and this word for anointing, has to do with, with pouring out in a very abundant manner. It's related to the fat of the land. Now, it's used in that way just to speak about abundance, that which is good. And the purpose here is, is not so much a what we usually think of when we hear the concept of anointing, that we get anointed by the Holy Spirit, that's empowered, provided for, illuminated. Yes, God does all of those things. But, but here, what he's saying is this concept of anointing is not so much the anointing of the Holy Spirit for, for ministry purpose, but it's anointing, the language speaks about being anointed for comfort. It is having that oil that, that is a fine fragrance that, that comes down upon your, your body. It, it feels good. It comforts physically, also emotionally. It's also an act of, of restoring one. And what, what God is saying here is even in the midst of the enemy's activity, God can still bless us, provide for us, show us his luxurious pleasure that he pours out 
upon us. So you anoint my head with oil. And notice in the context is right here when he says, Kos, Rivia. Kos is, is oftentimes a vessel, that which contains something. And when it says, my cup, and it's one for being, I believe the best way to translate this is saturated, and that's why it says usually, my cup overflows. It is an abundance of God's provision to make us fill the love of God, the, the care of God, God's provision which, which satisfies. And all of this, he says, he's able to do while the enemy is, is carrying on their, their purposes. God can, not in other words, shield us from all the attacks of the enemy while he continues to minister unto us. Now, in the midst of this, we should be thinking about, why does God do all these things? And we talked about it. The reason is in order that we can worship him. You never, hear this very carefully, you never ever, there's never a situation, nothing that goes on in your life that should keep you from worshiping God. Here's the major takeaway from, from this time of study. If you want to live a, a victorious life, if you want to live in a way that is truly expressing the life that God has imparted to you in every circumstances, no matter what you experience in all things, worship God. Realize the real battle of the enemy is this. What he desires more than anything else, yes, his name means adversary. Yes, he brings adversity into our life, but why? Well, there's two reasons. Number one, he enjoys seeing the pain of others, the misfortune of others. And that's why when something good happens to someone other, some other person, you need to rejoice. If, if that makes you feel less, if that speaks to your insecurity, this is something that you need to pray about. You need to say, God, God, you've got to change me because I am not the, the child that, that, that reflects your attributes, your thoughts, your perspective, how you see things. God, you've got to work and build me up and edify me so that I can rejoice for the good things that happen for others. See, Satan only rejoices when bad things happen to others because he thinks other people's defeat lifts him up. What a horrible way to think. Secondly, and here's the, the real, real takeaway. Satan wants to stop you from worshiping God. So no matter what's going on in your life, even sometimes when we really mess up, we feel so unworthy, and we are, to worship God, worship Him anyway. We're always, in reality, unworthy to worship Him. So even when we fail in a big way or a little way, it makes no difference. Continue to worship God. Never let anything, big or small, stop you from worshiping God. If you can come to the end of your day saying, I've worshiped God, I praised Him, I gave Him thanks, yes, I'm hurting, yes, I, I, I'm missing this, I, I'm whatever, but you continue to worship God, you're going to see the power of God come into your life to bring a change in your circumstances, and you will be given a great testimony by Him to share. Well, let's come to the end of, of the text, last verse, the Hebrew text, verse 6. The Hebrew word is ach. It can mean but or surely. It's a word that, that uh, makes what follows thereafter uh, emphatic. It emphasizes, emphasizes it. And he says, surely, tov ve va chesed. Tov, the will of God. Now, normally we translate that word goodness, but it's just another example that what is good is the will of God. And I experience the goodness of God in his will. And the reason why the next word is chesed, the grace of God, surely goodness and grace, because I can never take hold of the will of God 
unless I first take hold of the grace of God. So he says, surely goodness and grace, and this is God, they will pursue me. You, you don't have to worry about uh, God's will. He will make it known to you. It is pursuing you. And with this knowledge of God's will, God will supply grace. And as I say so frequently, yes, grace is the, the element that saves us. Grace is related to mercy. Grace is what's necessary to experience forgiveness. Grace is what's there to bring about regeneration of us. But grace also works in our life to bring us to the will of God. Not just that we stumble upon it, but we are provided for in order to accomplish that will. So he says, surely goodness and grace will pursue me all the days of my life. You know how you can translate that? Every day. Every day. God's will is presented. It is pursuing us. And God will give us grace in order to bring about the completion for that day of his purpose, of his will. So surely goodness and grace will pursue me all the days of my life. That's why I have life, that I can do his will. And I will notice the destiny that we have. And I will, this is a promise. We should affirm it. We have assurance concerning this. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Now, rabbinical scholars, the sages of Judaism, speak about when they look at this phrase, wherever it appears, when it says, Bet Adonai, we're talking about the temple, the place for what? Worship. So I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Why? To worship him. And this is my eternity. That's why it says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord, le orech, orech yamim, for the extension of days, the lengthening of the days, and this is a Hebrew idiom for eternity. What we have to look forward to is eternity in worshiping God. And why that is so wonderful is that there is a relationship between worshiping God and experiencing the presence of God, being in the presence of God. So surely goodness and grace will follow me all the days of my life, and that's going to propel me ultimately that I will dwell, and the implication is I will dwell and continue to dwell and forever dwell in the house of the Lord, worshiping Him, for the lengthening of the days. In other words, forever. Psalm 23, what a rich revelation to cause us to think differently. And if we think differently, here's the good news. We will behave differently. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.